mistake stops in the morning. Namely, remember, I mentioned that, and I, I in my, in one of my books, I have a chapter where I'm totally nothing, of course, or, on architecture. But I like what I developed there. I think this is how symbolic space, or even our space experience, once we are in the symbolic universe, blah, blah, is organized. What always fascinated me is in what a simple way this works, this discordance between inside and outside. For example, it happens to me, maybe I am the idiot. Tell me how it is with you. You are inside a car. The wind, uh, the, uh, the window is closed and you look outside. But still, it like when you open the window, you can be hit how, how should I put it? It's not the same reality as the one you see from the inside. How it hits you with its proximity or whatever. So, uh, or I always like the other experience. How sometimes in a house, when you look at it, when you are inside, outside, it looks a small house. You have this strange experience that once that the inside can be bigger than the outside, you know. You know where I had this almost metaphysical experience? You know, I think it still is the best bookstore in UK, in England. It's Blackwell, I hope it still exists, it didn't go down in Oxford. But there the effect is real for a simple reason, because it's a, this small English house on the outside. You enter, then of course they expanded it down up, but still, you know, because the house is so small, you you look at it, sorry, you experience it in a certain mystical way, like it's a small house, you enter it, it's there. And I think, again, that space is never neutral. To have, again, that was my point, our human experience of space. Somewhere in your experience of space, there must be this kind of invisible line which separates inside from outside. And again, the place of the horror is not so much inside, but as I said, mentioning Stephen King and so on, it's that mysterious space in between. It always comes with it. Like this separation inside, outside, now I'm speaking about our phenomenological experience of space, never works. And uh, this is incidentally also uh, my reading of Hitchcock, that he all the time plays with this space. Not only what I obviously mentioned there, the crack from which uh, Scotty is looking at Madeleine, but uh, generally, uh, let me tell you another of these uh, everyday mysticism experiences. And I checked it with my friend, okay, maybe we are all freaks, I don't know, maybe it's not universal. But it was, did you notice how we relate at everyday level to shit, <coughs> to excrements? They, like, they disappear. You go to the toilet, you flush it, they disappear. But, you know, you never think, where do they go? Okay, you do think when the toilet is whatever blocked and blah, blah, blah. But how, it's as if, you know, it's neither outside, outside it's clean, neither, there is some architectural in-between reality, and this is why I think the truly mystical space in a house are those in between the walls and so on, where you have all the communications, electricity comes, shit goes out, whatever. And I think that Hitchcock, again, quite often place with this space, you know where, it may sound so naive, but it works. For example, in Psycho, you saw Psycho, uh, you literally have toilet a couple of times there. Now I will give you a test. Imagine, Hayes code, know the rules you remember, no? Uh, where, which, do you know which scene in Psycho? for which shot Hitchcock had to fight most with censorship. Because Psycho is 1960, so 59, so it was just the last desperate attempts of, uh, uh, of the uh, 
uh, uh, Hays Code, no? You know which scene? No, the murders or all those dead mother horrors. You remember towards the end of the film when uh, Vera Miles, the sister of Marion Crane and John Gavin, the, he was the, the ambassador of the United States in Mexico, the guy who, not Anthony Perkins, the guy who plays uh, 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 the lover of Marion Crane, uh, and he, they, uh, when they enter the cabin, the motel, Bates Motel cabin, where, uh, how do they find the trace of her in the toilet? You remember? Uh, he, I think, not her, looks for a moment into the toilet bowl and there is a piece of paper on which it is 40,000 minus dollars, whatever. The only thing Hitch Hitchcock had to fight most ferociously for that to be allowed. That, so, because it's absolutely prohibited. This was the utmost horror to show the inside of the toilet. And Hitchcock had to make, take care, you can check it, how it's absolutely fanatically clean. And I claim that if you then read from here, Hitchcock, you can see as a permanent motive places which function as toilets. The toilets in the simple sense of somewhere a dark, swallowing place where unpleasant or disturbing things disappear and they can return, you know, like where. In uh, Psycho itself, I claim, you remember behind Norman Bates' house, there is a small swamp where houses, uh, sorry, cars disappear with victims. And do you remember the very last shot of the film? On a rail, they are pulling uh, the car out, no? I think it's, it, within this symbolic place, that swamp is another big toilet for Norman Bates. And so, Norman Bates is my ethical hero, not for what he is doing, but what I like is this attitude of, you know, cleaning things and getting rid of them, you know, which was for a long time, I hope you all saw Psycho, my favorite scene there. You remember, after the first murder, that wonderful, almost 10 minutes detailed scene when Norman Bates is cleaning the toilet. And I had such sympathy for him, with horror I noticed he didn't do it, my God, there is one space there with a small stain. And so, uh, 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 okay, you have this there. Then I claim even, if you saw Vertigo, you remember at the very end of Vertigo, the final confrontation, the two of them, sorry, that is to say, Kim Novak, Madeleine, Judy, and Scotty, basically, it's a very strange film. It's... Uh, it's almost a happy ending, do you remember? He accepts her, he, Scotty, recognizes that her love is authentic, they embrace. At that point, you remember, Sakharova entrance opens in the floor and a nun or whatever mother superior comes up and it's totally irrational how she reacts. Uh, 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 and she, I mean, uh, uh, Judy, the woman, and, and falls down. I think it's the same, although we know rationally, of course, it's the tower and up, uh, but it's as if, you know, some disgusting anal character, whatever, comes. It's like shit returning, you know, you thought you flapped it and it, and it, it, it's, this is so beautiful about Hitchcock. This is what I like it, I've written about it. In how many of his films you have the same visual motive, repeating itself, but not as a symbol. I think all readings, some French, gu French guys tried it, all readings of Hitchcock, which read this, uh, which interpret this recurring, repeating, which repeats themselves, uh, uh, motives as symbols, don't work. That's the beautiful mystery. It's a kind of an empty signifier, literally. It's just a motive which repeats itself with one meaning, you know, which is the best known one. You remember the very beginning of Vertigo? You must remember that uh, Scotty, when they are pursuing the bad guy and the policeman above, and this is a recurring motive. Uh, so many times it happens, for example, you have it uh, 
uh, this motive of uh, do you, did you see north by northwest? Yes. You remember at the very end, uh, again, uh, uh, I think she, Yves Marie Saint, and incidentally, no wonder she was one of Hitchcock's favorite actresses. Just think about her name. Yves Marie Saint. Both of them, Yves, Sheen, and Marie. The Virgin. It's an incredibly Hitchcockian name, you know. How, you remember the scene on the edge of that cliff? She, uh, again, just clinging by the hand, pulling her up, not, that's there. Then you have it at the end of To Catch a Thief. Cary Grant holds, not Grace Kelly, but the murderer, the, the bad woman, as it were. Again, it's the same motive. Then you have it already in Saboteur. At the end, the bad guy is hanging from the hero's hand on the top of Statue of Liberty. There, of course, is the bad ending slowly. He falls down and so on and so on. But again, and uh, Hitchcock's universe is so full, so full of this, uh, I call them, using a specific Lacanian term, symptom. S-I-N-T-H-O-N, like not symptom. Symptom is already meaning. But as Lacan <coughs> uh, uh, repeatedly says, symptom is something different. It's just some kind of a minimal symbolic formation and it's just a minimal libidinal investment. A gesture, a motive, which is repeated with a certain libidinal content, but with no specific meaning. Like, you can say what I'm always said, like, look who's talking about, because I'm full of this nervous gestures and so on, you know. But what I want to say is that it's, again, wonderful to read Hitchcock and other real movie makers in this way. You know why I'm saying this? I didn't, again, lose the thread in my neurotic Confusion. Although I have here in this room a clinical debate with Alain Badiou. As a joke, I told him we are an ideal couple of I'm the hysteric provoking him, he is the master. You know, this is one of the classic psychotic dualities. And then he said he agrees, then I said, but I want a different status for myself. The time, if there ever was one, the ideal compulsive obsession and neurotic. And Alain insisted, no way, you are a hysteric one. I don't give you the dignity of being obsessed and neurotic. So, what I want to say is that, uh, uh, you remember in the morning when I was improvising that motive of pre-ontological reality, some chaotic form, but which is not totally formless, which exists, but it's not yet the symbolic form. Now, for reasons into which I cannot go, I don't agree with Julia Kristeva, but maybe it is similar to her distinction between symbolic and semiotic. You know, semiotic, the platonic, Cora, as some kind of pre-symbolic order, but nonetheless minimal order, which it's not yet the level of meaning which exists. Uh, and uh, now there are so many ways to progress here, because, you know, to cut a long story short, here Lacan disagrees with Badiou. Badiou's notion of subject is, and he even uses this term repeatedly, that it's a subject without object. For Lacan, precisely, you need an object, and this object will be precisely this minimal object, a minimal, some minimal ridiculous forum to beat you, which can be totally ridiculous, but you are attached to it. Unknowingly, everything hinges on that. Like, you touch, you know what I like, maybe one nice imaginary form of this would have been another science fiction motive of, as it were, opening the wrong door or pushing the wrong button, you know. I found it with some stories like, you, or the hero, or the actor there, enter a space and you see some small something to pull, a button to press, and you think, oh, it's nothing, let's try it. But then you experience when it's too late that that button, that tiny detail was holding together the entire reality, you know. And I'm not kidding, 
in my book, which was tearing with the negative, I think. And I report on what I remember clearly happened to me in Paris. I really had an experience like that. Of course, afterwards, I learned what it was about. It was easily to be explained in a rational way. No? Okay, here is the experience. I was, it was deep winter, freezing, and, okay, I had to go to the toilet. Okay, it's vulgar, but don't be afraid. I will not go in this, that, that. Okay, I did my work of shitting, blah, blah. Then I just flushed the water. And it was unbelievable. Yes, the water was flat, no? But then it went on. Water started to fall from the... F and then what did I do wrong? I just flushed the water and literally we had to call the, the, the firework. You know, like it was an inundation, it was flat. It just went on and on. And then the fireman who came gave a perfect explanation that it was frozen and at the same time a little bit warmer defrozen, something like that. And I was the first to use that apartment for a long time. So what happened was that when I, what happened is that one, uh, how do you call this, square tube or what, where the water is, uh, because, you know, you have these problems in winter, which is why if you don't have a heated uh, apartment, you even have to wrap the tubes if they are outside, because if water freezes there, you know, this is the limit of my physical knowledge. I heard somewhere, I'm not sure I believe it, but that you know, that water to ice, it expands, no, it can explode. So what happened is that the, the tube or whatever did explode, and then, uh, 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 but then since nobody used it, there was no, it's very simple, there was no, so we you know when I, I triggered, when I pushed it, I, it was open crack, I triggered it, but still it was such an incredible experience, you know, like, oh my, you know, I wanted to disappear, to it. You flash that button and take the water, <laughs> water, first, you know, and it went like in a good horror movie, so gradual, you know, first a couple of drops, drops, <laughs> <I> said, okay, <laughs> all of it, then it was literally falling down, literally, at the end, it was like like a couple of inches of water down everywhere. We didn't know how to stop it, and so on and so on. It's literal version of Freud in his Traumdeutung reports a wonder, a dream of you know a small boy urinating that he goes on and on. It's a stream. It's a river. It's an ocean. And trans, ocean. How do you call it? Liner. Big ship passes by and so on. It was. I don't know why it happens. So often to me, this such I, there's something crazy in me that attracts the attention of a. Because I, let me tell you another story. My worst. Ah, uh, it happened to me once. It was even worse. Uh, but the other guy was a victim. I'm really an obsessional neurotic, which means I'm terrified by you know like I come back, I see someone was in my room, and you know when I left, it was like this. Then, no, fuck you, somebody leaves it like this. I'm ready to kill for this, you know. So what happened, it's, it's a very complex relation, but you will see the effect. I was, this is maybe the best feeling in all my life. I felt so perversely satisfied. What happened is, I was staying with a friend in their analytic apartment. Analytic, which means there were three rooms where analysts were working. I was sleeping in one. And I didn't like it because then, you know, in the morning I always had to make it clean, erase the traces of my presence because there were... Okay, now what happened was this. I did something very simple. I came home just to deposit some stuff there, immediately to go out. I came home and I heard that there is an analysis going on, patient and the analyst in a nearby room. So I took care to go on very, very, in a very silent way. Nobody heard me. I stepped to my, uh, entered my room, just leave behind their hidden a couple of books that I bought. I wanted to go out to be free in the evening. And then, yeah, 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 yeah. I noticed a book there. 
on the table, just like this. You know, with my obsession and neurotic proto-fascist order, I said this can, and I even notice where this book belongs there. That is the ultimate trauma of me. You see a book just there, you see the gap in the bookshelf. I couldn't resist it. I did this. Literally, I drove a guy almost to madness like this. Because, you know, I learned then what happened. The guy who was doing the analysis, minutes earlier, was trying to return to the friend of mine a book. So he put the book on the table, and then the patient rang the bell, so he left it there, didn't have time to look where it belongs, and received the patient, and then there was something wrong with this patient, I didn't know this, but it was, I came there, it was very fast, and all I did is, one minute, enter the room, silently, leave my books, put the book without, so this guy, he didn't hear anything. Three minutes later, too, she came back, the book was not there, was she? She seriously had a breakdown, he told, called a psychiatrist uh, and uh, thought he's going crazy. I learned this because they were friends with my friends, that guy. So in the evening, I, uh, we sat at dinner and the lady of the house told me, you know that friend of ours, he totally got crazy, he, he had a breakdown and so on. And I don't know why, but when I told them the truth, everyone took it for normal, that there is something in me that it's enough that I'm there and this catastrophe is Which is why, and I felt so well. I like this, uh, this is typical obsession and neurotic enjoyment, you know. You are in for nothing, you know. Nobody even knows, you just do something, nobody you cause a catastrophe and you can look, <laughs> I did nothing, you know. Which is why I remember some stupid journalist in early 90s asked me this pathetic question, you know. Oh, when did you really feel free, you know. They thought I will take... I will tell them some, some uh, democratic bullshit, like when we were fighting communist terror. No, 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 I told them when. I still remember it. When I was much younger, you know, these were pre-digital times, where the old phones, and you know, like, there was practically no way when somebody calls to uh, check it up, which number, and so on. Okay, so I was at home, and the phone was ringing. I picked it up and somebody said, is Maria there? And then, okay. I knew no Maria, it was clear, it's a wrong number. And then I didn't do it because it's so bad. I'm not really ethical. I'm just a common decent guy. But I was instantly, I remember now the pain of renouncing it, tempted to cause a catastrophe. Because I knew I was in a position of absolute freedom. Whatever I do there, the guy didn't think it's me, it's Maria's apartment. So I can tell whatever I want with impunity. Yes, I am you. But you know what Plato said, there are two types of persons only. People who do evil things and people who just dream about doing evil things. So my instant idea was to say something like, I'm sorry, here is the medical emergency service, Maria just had a breakdown, probably she will not survive, but... And it's so wonderful, I would have caused the catastrophe, but you know, nobody would have, nobody could have identified it to me. And again, even now, I feel the pain that I, this would be, but you laughed at almost killed me. But I told him, this is my proximity, how I missed my event. You know? <laughs> so, uh, what I'm saying is that, I'm not getting here, you see that this, this is typical obsessional neurotic hypocrisy. This is typical, sorry, not neurotic, hysterical. No, hysterics are the opposite, you know, hysterics are uh, open, explode, but... This is the obsession and neurotic of hysterical position of subjectivity. To do something which is to operate, as it were, from a totally empty space, abstract. To do something which cannot even be, be, traced, uh, be traced back uh, back at you. But what I'm saying is that uh, uh, this is why architecture always interests me intelligent manipulations of architectural space. For example, let me tell you another crazy example. When I introduced this idea 
again, some stupid architect asked me at the architect conference, uh, what would be your ideal building? And I told him, my ideal building would have been something like, <coughs> you know, <coughs> usually, <coughs> sorry, we distinguish in buildings central places and places which are just appendi appendixes, accessories, a building which is without central places, just a big staircase, one toilet like this, and nothing, that's all. And they told me, but we have it, it's even well known, and they are right. Were you in Guggenheim Museum in New York? That one, the, it's exactly this. You go up and it's just a big staircase which goes down. So I was always attracted by this idea of, uh, Benjamin wrote about this, of making out of these places of passage, like staircase, the place where, really, where things really happen. I mean, this is Benjamin's very naive but nice reading of why for the imperial Paris that Garnier, the old big opera house, is so important. Because his reading is, forget about the opera, the true place are that big gigantic stairs, where, you know, ladies show their dresses, men meet, and so on. I mean, you know, the building is not built, uh, stairs are not built to enter the opera hall, the, the, uh, the, the opera hall with chairs and podium is built to give justification so that people can go up and down the stairs. Uh, or now I'm a little bit, we are approaching object A, Lacanian, because this would be, I know you are preparing your knife, please strike it. No, no, it's not a knife. But uh, okay. Don't tell me, don't, don't try to be <laughs> Benigni. No, I'm really a good girl. <laughs> you don't do that. Okay. So please go on. Okay, the, the, the Lacanian subject supported on object A is not or I don't think it is, a symmetrical reversal of the subject without object. No, 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 absolutely, okay. I agree. Okay, can we go... Because what, sorry, what both reject is this classical subject-object, no? Because object yes. A precisely is not this modern philosophy subject confronted with object. Well, exactly, and this, okay, we're going to talk about the object A. The subject of that object that maybe Badu is talking about, an object might be the one of the counter's one, or a one in appearance, perhaps, but the object A, that's, I mean, the way I think of it is that's sort of the efficacy of the count as one procedure itself. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, no, no, it's you are like right. It's an object energy. which is purely intersubjective formal effect. It's an object without any substance and it's, so on. Would you also just call that whenever thinking negativity as subtraction? That would be like subtractive effect. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, like the exactly. word subtraction the same yeah, way that yeah, you yeah, use yeah. it. But but here I have a problem, and I, sorry, you finished no, 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 too no, much. No, no, I'm no, sorry, no. I'm sincerely sorry. Oh, I'm kind of losing my, no, no. It go, happens go. to me all the time. You have still 30 years to really start to oh. lose your threat, you know. <laughs> okay, uh, there's, 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 there's an ambiguity here, and it's with respect Again, to... Again, it's in, with but you himself, but let's go on. <laughs> What's with that? The ambiguity concerning subtraction. It Sometimes... Is. I think there is, and it's an ambiguity that strikes right at the heart of that. You always says... He is remaining a materialist, a materialist, a materialist. But when you've got object A, that efficacy, that is true. That not that true dialectical material? That's the stuff. That's the something yeah, yeah, that costs yeah. nothing. But that's it's immaterial, nonetheless immaterial. Oh. And that's where we agree with Alain. That uh, wait, to be wait, a proper wait. materialist, you have to include immaterial object. It's, okay. Sorry, she finishes the Does it function the strategically? Okay, the appearance of object A, does that function strategically the same as what bad you calls... Uh, the unicity of in existence. Sorry, the unicity, the inexistent. Uh, yeah, yeah, unicity. yeah. So there's yeah, there's can. these two levels yeah, of one going yeah, on. One yeah. of the count is one. Then there's an authentic unicity said of efficacy. That's an ambiguity that I see here going on. Where ex now you got me? I don't want to bluff. Where exactly in the one context does he say this? The unicity yeah. of existence, the second manifesto of philosophy. I have. Ah. I can give you quotes. It's no. the greatest one. And what's so interesting about that is there's kind of two orders of, I think, materiality that could be going yeah. on because in the first manifesto, he says the most important concept is being as the generic. In the second one, he says, I'm moving away from being as the generic to the subjectivizable body. To the subject? Subjectivizable body. Uh, yeah, 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 I know, I know, yeah, yeah. Okay. But you know where I 
have a problem here and also not a problem but like difference and I checked it up in detail later, not in my book uh, 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 Organs Without Bodies, I always was intrigued by why did Deleuze and Gattari chose the phrase organs without bodies, sorry, bodies without organs, why not the opposite one? For me it's so obviously true that the correlate of individual or the classical soul, person, is a body. A subject doesn't have a body, I claim. The correlate of subject is an organ. It can be even in this imaginary way, you know, a big eye or in, like in surrealist paintings or films, just a hand. a hand, which is why I like, you know, the, the, how is it called, that movie, my God, it's not Nolan, it's David Fincher, I think, he did, no, sorry, who did, who did uh, 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 Fight Club? David Fincher. Yeah, you remember that wonderful scene, one of the mega scenes, where Edward Norton confronts his boss, and then his fist becomes autonomous and starts to beat him. It's a tremendously efficient scene. It's much more terrifying than if he were to attack directly. So, okay, let's go on. Organ, something bothers you there. No, like well, in, so can it be very aggressive? Call, it's, 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 sorry, just to finish, it's in my nature to be anti-feminist, aggressive. I can see like, you know, really? Aristotelian, oh, you know, Aristotelian theory, hysteria, the histron, how do you call it? Mothers, you know where the term hysteria comes? Oh, yeah, the yeah, uterus is moving, you know? Oh. <laughs> I can see your uterus moving. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to try it, you know? So please do it and then you. I didn't forget. Okay, oh, 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 body for Deleuze. You just said body would correspond to the individual, whereas organs for subject. I think that's to a degree right, but Deleuze was always, and you would agree, reactive against any form of subjectivity. He was always on the side of the violence of life. But I don't think Deleuze necessarily thought body either. The closest he would have went, been in thinking body as body as a true unicity that could have been said of material yeah. efficacy, like what a body can do, yeah. would have been in the universe. No, but he explains it. Do you know that there are two, three pages in uh, Le, Le Mille Plateau, Thousand Plateaus, where oh. one or two pages where uh, the lesson Gattari directly approached this topic, as if they were not idiots, my god, the, le the less was a mega genius, I admit it, you know. When he, and he gives arguments which don't convince me. The argument is that organ is always part of some organic order, proto-fascist, organs serve this, that, and precisely if you say body without organs, some kind of a, and I can also see it, for example, the way I read in that stupid How to Read Lacan book, the way I read Lacan's concept of lamella, pure life or pure death drive, and I read it through, of course, uh, Alien, you know, in Alien, in the first one. The second one, Cameron, should be burned. The second one is simple adventure movie, you know. But the first one, the object is, sorry, that monster is this kind of a, pure, irresistible, undead life, which you cut it, whatever, it returns radical plasticity, to use this Catherine Malabu term. Okay, I can see how you can say this is pure life without organs. But nonetheless, I claim because of a long tradition that a much more efficient way to undermine the corporate order, nonetheless, you know, corporatism is corporatism, is to claim, again, an organ without a body, an autonomous organ. So, strike back. Uh, no, I don't... Oh, this, is, this is kind of hard. It kind of... No, no, but I don't mean it just in the jokeish way. I mean, if, if no, you no, really I know, have it's some hard theoretical for me to sit here and think and say it, but the yeah. problem with organs that just, I find a little... I'm not, I'm not arguing. This is not... Because, because you know, I also it. refer to this long horror tradition where... And I, think, I try to re reassert this as something positive, mm -hmm. not as monstrosity. This idea that you lie, you, your subjectivity is a lie, <coughs> but then truth emerges through an organ which doesn't obey your subjectivity. See, you know, I like this idea. I, yeah, that's why Nietzsche thought that Hegel was so vulgar. Um, you think it was working? Hegel is the most 
vulgar philosopher. You know how many obscenities you find if you read Hegel close. But it starts with Kant. You know this. Of course. Kant is the beginning of not only do you know, Sergei, do you know Kant's definition of marriage? A contract among two others, adults about the mutual use of sex organs for pleasure. <laughs> Without any sublim and you know when one page later Kant asks the question, so if a husband runs away, does the wife have the right to bring him back? with police. Kant's answer, yes, not because any deeper social bond, but because according to the contract, he ran away also with his penis, that is to say, an organ which was co-owned by her. It's beauty, that's the genius of Kant. Sorry. The genius of but the problem, still a true problem, is that subjectivity is not in the same place as the place of efficacy. What do you mean? I, we would have to go here in the sense of what do you mean? Ah, this is a nice so question. Too. What do you mean about efficacy? Are you playing? Are you reheating this old agamben soup of oh. e efficacy? No, I'm just kidding here. I'm sorry. E the, you know this old trick from Kier Kierkegaard onwards to put possibility higher than actuality, because what I'm more and more fascinated is. The opposite took that the real, one of the names of the Lacanian real, would have been an actuality which is impossible. Mm -hmm. It's impossible but real. An actuality which is not the realization of an impossibility. It's in kind of in excess of its own space of possibility. I always like to turn things around, like even with object A, Lacan, I think, in a totally wrong way. At some point claims, when he tries to distinguish the proper object A from uh, this mirror relationship, he says object A is like vampires somewhere in his early work, in the sense that, you know, vampires, as we all know, this is what I was teaching my son before he knew about literature, like how you kill a vampire, well, that the vampire, they don't have the image, mirror image. But my idea is, what the object A is the exact opposite. I saw this in some horror movies. It's something that only exists in the mirror. You know, in a horror movie, I don't know which one, I found this wonderful scene of the guy looks at himself in the mirror and sees some horrible outgrowth, something too much. Then he touches, looks, there is nothing in reality. I think this is maybe the object A. You know, something, this goes to you against actualization and so on, you know, that's, that's just in the, let's go on. Are you then, then this is the question. Now comes the KGB, it. the no, 33, is, are you then? It's kind of a cheating question, it's just, are you thinking any kind of subjectivity that is still different from the split subject? Yeah, but Lacan says this. Lacan uses, when he speaks about subjective and it, I struggled for a long time to read it properly. It says how often Lacan, when Lacan, okay, I'll put it like this. In, when Lacan, uh, you, you, uh, when Lacan redefines the goal of analysis as traversing the fantasy and so on, although this is another of those mystical elements, it's now almost a common doxa that for Lacan, the final moment of psychometric treatment. But you know that, and I, maybe you can <coughs> refute me here, but I spoke with people, and I've read a lot of Lacan, who really cover it all, and I asked them a simple question. There is one passage in the last chapter of Seminar 11, when Lacan uses the phrase traversing the fantasy, but even not as a substantive, not la traversée du fantasme, but as just as an ordinary verb, the subject traverses the fantasy. It's only once, it's what I think in logic it's called hapax or what, you know, an, a universality which has paradoxically only one, uh, and how this exploded, exploded into, into, into a concept. So I think what Lacan is aiming at there, and he even says, he says then at another place, in another, that, uh, the subject at that point, uh, he uses such a tremendously Hegelian term that I was shocked. The subject 
over Kansky's division and posits itself as its own cause. I mean, it's something so madly idealist. But I think this doesn't mean that Lacan is becoming some kind of uh, absolute idealist. It's simply that, I mean, it can be read in a very simple materialist way that you see that you fully accept that object A as your cause, the cause of your desire, whatever, is not substance. That is just another perspective of your own void. This is why Lacan, this is how, in a very primitive way, I understand Lacan's, uh, as pure parallax, Lacan's, uh, this Mebius band. You know, for me, object A and subject are just two sides on the same, you know. They are not, and it is precisely because object A is, as Lacan puts it, is a phantasmatic feeling of what you, of your impossible positive being, as it were. But uh, here things get complicated, and I think, okay, let me give you a solution, then we go on, because, my God, this is getting crazy, but this is what I like, this theological topic. Uh, you know what Lacan does wonderfully? You know where we can measure where Lacan does struggle to formulate a subject which is not a divided subject? Ah, here I must say, with all my political and so on conflicts with Chuckel and Miller, one has to, how do you say in theological terms, give to the devil yeah, what belongs to the devil. Chuckel and Miller is nonetheless a magician, the best education guy, pedagogic master that I ever met. He's a magician in the sense of, and this was my happiest time maybe, early 80s, when I was for two, three years in Paris, part of this inner seminar. 20, 25 of us met once a week and for a whole semester just studied some most difficult Lacan. We went in detail through subversion of the subject, dialectic of desire, and then through Kant of Exat. And what was so magical, this was the magic of uh, Miller, was you have a page which is extremely dense, you get nothing. You listen to Miller for two hours, and it's this pure magical event, but it's so clear and simple. <laughs> How was I so stupid not to get it, no? And he, uh, Miller, drew attention to this in a wonderful way. How? Namely that, you know, I love Miller. This is the most, this is the true philosophical genius. When you ask the most elementary questions, which are, okay, and I ask you and me, I'm not playing patronizing guy, the idiot here, it's me, myself. Uh, okay, divided subject. Fuck you, divided between what and what. <laughs> and it's, it's absolutely clear. Miller improvised wonderfully for over one hour of this that if you, it's definitely not the standard Freudian between your conscious illusory self-image and some fuck you deeper unconscious. Miller developed so nicely that she quoted, I remember, you know that Alfred Ayer, that British analytical philosopher, who had a wonderful idea that the dream of logic, which is of course impossible, is that if you divide an object, you know, like, you know this boring Zeno paradox game, I can divide this, I can divide it again, what if this process is not endless? What if, if you bring division to the end, you arrive at the point where you no longer can divide it between a something and another something, but a division is a division between something and nothing. You know that you arrive at a point where all that remains is a part, but a part which is not part of a complementary whole so that you add a part, it's a part and nothing. And then uh, Miller claimed that this is the point which, in a way, you reach at the end of analysis, where it's no longer this signifier against that one, double signifier, it's a signifier and nothing. And this nothing is the subject. And then she went on, ah, ah, very nicely, claiming that to escape this pure division, something and nothing, you mobilize fantasy, no? And you know where, even now I will give you a very primitive example. Sorry to neglect you, you should be more aggressive. I really apologize, but 
you see, we are orgasmic here. This, uh, we Lacanians love, we are like, you know, the medieval theologists debating these wonderful points, you know, which is, was incidentally a very important, very rational beneath the crazy, uh, beneath the crazy, uh, the stupid uh, impression, medieval famous debate, you know, how many angels you can put on the top of the needle, you know. I know it was a very important debate, it concerns the materiality of the spiritual and so on and so on, no? So what I'm saying is, back to this, that you know where in a very pre... My God, I will show you some of clips from Vertigo. Uh, uh, because then uh, I will try to... Should, uh, go if you have it, or maybe even on the, on the web. Uh, what is this for a bullshit? What is it? Is some new age? How you call some stupid spirits to protect you? <laughs> Look, uh, uh, there is, you remember in Vertigo, after, after Madeleine's suicide, which was a murder we learned, Scotty wanders around and finds a woman who looks like Madeleine. And I like this because it's a deeply philosophical point there. I often quote that wonderful Marx Brothers joke. You remember it? Like, it's one of my favorite. Marx Brothers joke, you know, they have all the time jokes about identity. You know, the best known one. You know, this man looks like an idiot, acts like an idiot, this shouldn't deceive you, this man is an idiot, you know. <coughs> then you have uh, another version, very Lacanian, where Groucho Marx is seducing that ugly old lady, <coughs> the standard, and says, I love you, everything on you reminds me of you, your eyes, your ears, everything except you, you don't remind me of yourself. And then there is the best one, the Emmanuel Ravelli from some early March, where uh, Groucho, I think it's Groucho, plays Emmanuel Ravelli and a guy tells me, oh, you remind me of Emmanuel Ravelli. No, sorry, Groucho meets someone and says, you remind me of Emmanuel Ravelli? The guy said, but I am Emmanuel Ravelli. And Groucho answers, well, if you are, then no wonder you look like. <laughs> and I think this is wrong. I think that precisely, you don't look like yourself. It's wrong to say this. So, uh, let's go. There is a shot. Yes, no, the point is uh, that vertigo, basically, the formula is basically this Marx Brothers joke. No wonder that Judy looks like Madeleine because she is Madeleine. You know, that's what we learn. And you know what's so interesting? You should do it. If you want to do an in-depth study of Hitchcock's Vertigo. It's a wonderful story of manipulation. Do you know that Vertigo is based on a French detective novel by those two famous authors, Boileau and Narcisse Jacques? They were classics of horror stories, blah, blah. And it was a conscious manipulation. They already wrote the novel. They afterwards admitted to seduce Hitchcock. And now comes the joke. I read the novel. You get it. I think now even with some cheap edition on Amazon or whatever. It's called uh, The Entree de Mort or what? The, the Re-Entry of the Dead, Return of the Dead, something like that. Uh, and what is so interesting is the total depoliticization uh, enacted by Hitchcock. That is to say, do you know that the original novel takes place during World War II, during resistance, and the same story is totally politicized there. You know, it's a resistance fighter who thinks his love was killed by Germans or whatever. It's absolutely incredible, the whole thing. But okay, vertigo, okay. You remember when when uh, Scotty sees a woman who looks like Madeleine, she, he follows her and, okay, slowly he seduces her. They go to a hotel, not hotel, to a simple boarding room, whatever, where she lives. Uh, and then you have an absolutely incredible shot. When they enter the room, it's totally dark after he takes her to, to dinner, I think. And the scene is like this. You have in the background a window and some totally artificial green light comes from a neon light just outside because this is fourth floor. And then you see Madeleine 
the, sorry, Judy, this new girl, first you see her in profile, but it's, and the profile is exactly the same profile as the one that I mentioned yesterday or when in the first scene in Ernest. Just in Ernest, you see her profile, beautiful, of Madeleine. Here, it's just darkness. It's a kind of a very primitive materialization of this idea that she's just, uh, the real Judy is just a fantasy screen for him. It's literally dark shape to project his Madeleine fantasy. Then, it's, then she turns her head a little bit around. And you literally get, you see half of her face, real features, and the other half is darkness. You literally get this division into something and nothing, and I think this is subjectivity at its purest. And what we call person, full human person, is precisely the role of fantasy is to fill in this void so that you get a full human person or whatever. So how to overcome this division? Uh, ah, it's in Lacan's... Okay, let me go back. Uh, usually, the usual story for idiots is that Descartes, the Cartesian subject, Cogito is non-divided, pure thinking, and that Lacan undermines this Cogito ergo sum into, you know, Lacan, but this is a story in itself, how the usual dog says, Lacan said, no, I don't, I am not where I think. Like to introduce a break between thinking and being. Uh, the story is much more mysterious. Lacan changed the formula three, four times. His first formulation was this simple one. Against Descartes, he claimed that, no, I am not where I think. But then he immediately got it that this can be simple life philosophy, in the sense of, you know, what I think is just the surface, but there are deep passions, where all the bullshit, where I really am, and you know, it's like the top of the iceberg, my reason. So he turned it around. His accent is then that the unconscious is not my being out of reach of my thoughts, it's the opposite. It's I think where I am not. What I am is my being is my imaginary identification, my God. I see myself, that's me. But unconscious is a thinking which goes on in existing outside my being. Then she wasn't even satisfied with this. She tried two, three other versions. For example, which one, but he was more playing, I think here. It's pretty intelligent. It is, I think, and then quotation mark, therefore I am, you know. Like to introduce this gap. Then there was, and now comes the paradox. At the end, in his absolutely, uh, are you asking me a question or just raising the hand? Just, okay, okay, sir. Uh, uh, I didn't forget about you, yeah. Uh, 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 he, at the end, in his, I think it's from 66, 67, correct me if I'm wrong, la, uh, Logic du Fantasma, Logic of Fantasy, his absolute crucial seminar, unfortunately not yet published, where, as I already mentioned, the first day here, I think, to the surprise of everyone, Lacan fully returns to Descartes and says, no, the subject, which is the Freudian subject, is the overlapping of thinking and being, but of course he pulls his trick, which is that the overlapping of the two is always an empty set. And he says that, what does it mean? I think cogito ergo sum. At that point, both thinking and being are empty. The being is no being at all. The being is just the being of your fleeting thought. It's the being of nothing. This, I think, therefore, I am, it's pure processuality of nothing. At the same time, what are you thinking? Nothing. You just think that you, you know what I mean, that it's an empty thought overlapping with an empty, uh, overlapping with an empty uh, being. And that at this point, you do <coughs> overcome your 
your division. And then the whole struggle of the late Lacan. And I agree with you here, it's more complex because Lacan was deeply disturbed by Deleuze and sometimes he does think flirt with Deleuzean direction. For example, when Lacan introduces the notion of drive, sometimes he does, uh, he does uh, talk like he characterizes drive almost in the terms of Deleuzean machines of desire. Drive as subjectless, kind of a life reproducing itself without subject. Uh, uh, he uses some terms like this or uh, another thing. In Seminar 11, when Lacan introduces Freudian notion of drive, because till, till Seminar 11, 63-4, Lacan is still didn't know what to do with drive. It was simply desire. No? Uh, there he uh, uses all the time the terms uh, montage, machine, and so on to emphasize that, as the less would have put it, that drive is machining. No? Drive is not instinct, this organic. Okay, why I'm saying this? Uh, 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 to, uh, to point out how Lacan was to the end struggling with this what happens beyond, and he was moving in different directions, one, uh, but for reasons that I don't have time to go into now, maybe we can do it if you are interested in these pure theological topics later, Lacan insisted to the end that drive is always a partial drive, that is to say that uh, no matter how, even when you do have this pure subject overcoming division, caught in pure drive, there must be some partial object, some little bit of a, of a symptom or whatever. And no, but what I, uh, uh, what I wanted to say here is that uh, Lacan himself is here ambiguous. Like he does use the term at the same time, subjective destitution, destitution subjective, is what happens at the end of analysis. And, okay, maybe for you I'm on the wrong side, because then, as always in theological disputes, there are two schools here. One, who in my universe are in Gulag, and I send them a voting card every day, every year, who think this means you are beyond subjectivity. No? I think not. I think that one should distinguish here between subject and subjectivization. The Lacanian subject is not a subject of subjectivization. It's not this subject of, you know, subject of inner life. Oh, I experience this and so on and so on. It's subject without subjectivization. Here, to be very precise, Lacan is against this deconstruction it bullshit where it's fashionable to say that subject is this typical Foucauldian topic that subject is the result of a process of subjectivization. And then you get all that bullshit, multiple subject positions, and so on and so on. No, for Lacan, subjectivization is always phantasmatic. It's kind of a uh, feeling in fantasies, and so on and so on. My God, time is running. I hate life. Yes, please. Yes, just to bring it back a little bit to the movie. Yeah. Ah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Actually, the one that um, that you were mentioning about mirrors, I, th it, I think it's uh, Dario Argento. Ah, he's cheap, cheap in a good sense. Yeah. Italian horrors. He uses I love them because of this pathetic. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, in a very operatic way, he uses the mirrors yeah. to show the, the what's really happening behind or what, what what's really gonna happen or yeah, what yeah. happened before. Yeah. Anyway, but um, uh, I was thinking uh, about the relationship between this crack. Yeah, the yeah. mystery, the horror that's yeah. there, and the definition, and um, the definitions or the space that exists on, in in the censorship or nowadays classification of yeah, movies. Yeah, no, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That uh, that the more I think that the more detailed, the more uh, expressed, the more yeah. um, colored and, mm -hmm. and defined the prohibition. Yeah, it's uh, the the more horrific it can become in a way that, uh, uh, when transgressed, perhaps. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I mean, all history of Stalinism 
confirms this. Yeah, it was the most detailed prohibition, but it was a nightmare. Then what horrible shot, please. Yeah, because, because the, the, for example, this classification system, uh, just because by chance I happen to, to indicate and find what, wh how it worked in yeah, different yeah. places, uh, in the United States, it's, um, it is as supposed to every other part in the Western yeah, yeah. hemisphere. It's, uh, the classification is not government body. It's a citizen body. I know. This was a wonderful Hollywood solution, case code. Yeah, yeah. It was nothing to do with the state, you know. Exactly. But effectively it worked because the whole distribution machinery uh, respected it. Exactly. Like if it you didn't get a case code classification, you were excluded. Sorry, yeah? It is separated and also it is a recommendation. It is not a classification. Uh, this it's is called true totalitarian works. Yeah, yeah, it is no, a no? recommendation yeah, and just, uh, yeah, it yeah. sets the tones and because they, they had to... Um, they had to, instead of leaving it to interpretation, which happens yeah. in other places, yeah. you know, there they had to, to, to um, run it down and say, okay, what makes, uh, what, what's after uh, classification R? It's uh, MC17, no? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so for example, a sex scene, no? Yeah. Um, uh, where obviously it's stated that uh, male genitalia shouldn't be seen, yeah. blah, 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 blah. but then uh, how many humps does that make a fuck? No, like a real. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's uh, even seconds. You know, the Hitchcock broke in notorious. Kiss was limited in classical Hollywood to three seconds, I think, and so on. Everything was it, uh, more than two humps. Yeah, is an NC17 classification. <laughs> so you can only do <laughs> two, and, <laughs> I can and then stay there, and then stay there, and you can stay there, and you can stay there. But that this makes is a wonderful because, like, 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 uh, I can imagine. Me, not you, like, nasty, like, let's say I'm too excited and finish too quickly, no? And then the woman said me, sorry, I wanted a full fuck, not an NC-17 fuck. We used it in real life. In real life. Oh, sorry. This thing of, uh, of the two humps and the, and the for example... I didn't know that even this you have, yeah. yeah. And that's, it, that's in the United States, like, it's very set down, like, mm -hmm. the rules, and particularly like, how many times this, how many yeah, times because what happens is that if you get an NC-17 rating, uh, like many um, uh, cinemas won't show you the, yeah, the yeah, film, yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Uh, you get a limited release, but, you yeah. get, but there's also the option, because it's separated from the government, yeah. there's the option of not having a classification. Yeah, but then of not having, the then, point is then it's getting without, distribution, no? Then it's, then it's without, uh, without classification, but uh, it is um, set to, uh, to interpretation, in a way, and nobody has time to interpret, so they just release them the films like, and if it works in the screens. Yeah, but you know what I would like to know? Which was the biggest commercial success without classification, without getting the approval? How far you can go? I think I think I, the the uh, Mel Gibson the the. Um, the passion? That one was without passion. Passion is an important, you know what is passion? You don't know. It's a radical gay sadomaso movie, you know, about torturing a male body. It's the big reassertion of homosexuality in Hollywood. That one yeah. went without classification. Really? Yeah. Yeah, but it got the support of all the Christian. Yeah. Yeah. But still, if you don't get classification, you would, I mean, think that they, they're above that. No, but the problem is, I think that's why it earned 400 million or what. Yeah. I think that the catch was that he mobilized or they mobilized themselves. All these religious groups which organize screening and they put pressure on... And how are you going to classify a true story? Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know where I came to laugh? The Pope, the other one, the Polish, you know the story? He saw the film. Because of all his aura, he didn't want to receive it in Vatican, Mel Gibson himself, but he did give an audience to, how do you pronounce the name, Jim Clavier, yeah. uh, the actor, Caviso. no? Jim Caviso. Yeah, Caviso. Caviso. sorry. And you know, I hate to laugh so much, you know what was Pope, the other, the good Polish one, not this Nazi guy who now runs the thing, <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know what was his comment? Like, it was like that. How does he know? <laughs> was he there or what? You know? yeah. On the contrary, we know it wasn't like that. Because Mel Gibson was always saying we wanted to be... No. The first thing you learn, I read the historian, he said that crucifixions were done in naked. 
Ah, 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 I didn't see Christ finish there, but so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Sorry, but go on. Yeah, yeah my, my feeling is that that, uh, that when it's more defined, when it gets this um, evolved, let's say the, the the classification or the mm-hmm. restriction in a way, it's the the horror, the mysterious thing aspect just grows mm-hmm. even more because if it's just set to interpretation, like uh, you can't show drugs in a film. Yeah. Uh, it's too big interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. And then there's a, you know, the, uh, it's, it can easily be, be accused of censorship. Yeah, yeah. Blah, blah. It becomes a, it's not so interesting, no? It's not so ah, mysterious. But, yeah, but they play with this already. This will amuse you. I spoke with, uh, I love him. My friend, my friend, okay. I mean, I met him through Sophie Fines, with whom I'm doing movie, Rafe Fines, no? I love him. He's such a wonderful, like he is the Badiou among actors, you know. <laughs> he's so naive, you know, he's promiscuous like hell. And then once he tries to seduce me, not sexually, but to write something which I did for his Coriolanus, and to show how intellectual he is, he told me, you know, Slavo, once I was tired in the evening doing a tour promoting a film of mine somewhere on the West Coast, and he said, at seven it was all over. I was so glad to be alone in a hotel room, and that was his flirting with me. I had a book of you, I think he got that one, comedy, tragedy, whatever, and I was looking to a nice evening, reading it, and then he said, somebody knocked on the door, a young groupie girl wanted to be fucked, and then he said, and this was such a lovely hypocrisy, I love it, he said, you know, all my heart, what is your good? But you know, I'm a star, it's my duty to do it. So unfortunately, my evening was ruined. And I liked it so much because, you know, like, like but you, when he said, so what's the problem? I'm the greatest philosopher, you know. He went it without any trace of irony, you know, like, what a horrible evening. I had to fuck a nice young girl, you know. So uh, again, he told me something which goes in the same, along the same lines as you. He told me that with a couple of movies, I wonder if you experienced this, in the United States, they're already doing it. You know, sometimes they do a director's cut and they claim uh, clips which were censored originally. But now, he told me it happened to him a couple of times. It's already, and then they use this in direct shortcut or in, you know, with DVDs you usually get yeah. deleted scenes. He told me that now it's part of the game. He was so furious when they finished shooting, the director said, now we will do some deleted scenes, you know, like, <laughs> they plan it in advance, you know, like, these things we do them for, uh, what will be the director's cut, you know, it's nothing. Today, it's not this kind of authentic process where director asserts his will or whatever. It's, it's all planned. So yes, yes, I agree with you. Another thing I wanted to tell you uh, about what you said, absolutely. I quoted in one of my books about this codification. There is a wonderful detail about how codified this was, about Joseph Sternberg, you know, the, uh, how is she called, the Marlene Dietrich. The, he did a movie in early 40s where the hero and the heroine, basically, what happens is they go to, what do we have in farmhouses, that soft, dry grass, hay, how do you call this? Hay, well, to fuck, no. But the problem was that, uh, okay, the point was how to signal this. And uh, he was called to, to hay coat offices where Breen, Joseph Breen, I think, was the big guy. Uh, uh, they thought about, should we do it like this, I like that. And then, finally, Joseph Breen, the censor, told him, listen, let's be frank, tell me what really happened, like openly, he asked him, did they fuck or not? If yes, we will find a way to signal this, but tell me what happened, you know, and, and then, after saying that this is just a gentle encounter, Sternberg exploded and said, yes, they had a good fuck. And then Joseph Brinder said, okay, now we know it, I will tell you how to signal this and so on, no? So what I think, and that's my perversion, is that maybe the truly Lacanian subversive thing would have been not to shot a scene with all these innuendos, no? But to arouse these innuendos and then somehow to let it know that nothing happened, you know.
The most horrible, sometimes subversive news is surface itself. I always like to repeat another old story, then I didn't forget about you, which happened to me, maybe you know it, I use it in my books. It's my fundamental experience, I love it. Uh, exactly as you said, how this logic that you described works also in politics. When I was young, I was not really a dissident. It was a soft communism, half dissident, whatever. Okay, there were elections in ex Yugoslavia. It wasn't as bad as in the East, but you knew always who will win. Of course, there were communist elections, but just that it wasn't like this Saddam Hussein or Stalin numbers. The party didn't get 99.9%, .9%, it got like 80% to make it more realistic. And it's always wonderful when totalitarian leaders want to be realistic, how it gets even more crazy. I read recently, you must have guessed who is my big love, Kim Jong-il. <laughs> you know what happened? They opened the first golf course, and of course he opened it. And the media reported, of course, the best result of all times. He, uh, only of 17 or 18 holes, only once or twice did he have to hit the ball two times. But I can imagine why didn't they go on to the end. Like, okay, 18 hits, 18 holes, you know. I can see some bureaucrat thinking, if we say it was always the first time, it would be non-realistic, you know. So let's have it that maybe once he missed it or whatever, no? So uh, what I'm saying is that the same there, we were more intelligent, no? Yugoslav communists. So, okay, what happened is this. It's a wonderful story. There were elections. We knew who would be. And our problem was how to annoy a little bit those in power, the party. Some of us advocated, not me, a radical dissident move. Let's simply, even if it's the last thing we do, let's simply publish an issue of our small student journal claiming it's a cheat, these were not free elections, and so on. But then we knew, every, first, we would just be maybe not arrested, but lost our position at the university, but we wouldn't tell anything new to anyone. <laughs> Who? Everyone knew, okay. So then one of us, not me, I admit it, got this absolutely ingenious idea. Let's su subvert it, not by giving some dark hints, oh no, it's not like this, really, these are not free elections. Those in power claim these are free elections. So let's just treat them as free elections and report precisely in the way one reports about free elections. So, on the evening of elections, we publish an extraordinary issue of our small student newspaper with the big title, Latest Election Results. It looks that probably communists will remain in power or whatever, you know. As if, you know, all the people were waiting for the... <laughs> and it was wonderful. We were immediately called to the Central Committee it wasn't really dangerous. There's some old party apparatchik shouting at us, no? But it was so tragic, I had immediate sympathy for him, because he told us, boys, don't fuck with me. Don't play such dirty games. We told him, but tell us, what did we do wrong? You claim these are free elections. We believe you, we treated them as free elections. What did we do wrong? Are you trying to say that these were not free elections? And it was so tragic that the guy couldn't, within the rules of the discourse, couldn't say, don't fuck with me, you know we always win, or what, no? He couldn't, so he was in such a difference, he just repeated, you know very well, guys, what I mean, don't fuck with me. <laughs> but tell us what, what, you know? It was so nice that, you know, and it was a wonderful thing, it was much better than do the open, uh, dissident gesture because the publicity was incredible. All the people were talking about it. And along the lines of what you said, this is why, who said this, Mandelstam or who? And there is a moment of truth in it that Stalinist society had the greatest possible respect for poets. It's the only country in the world, Soviet Union, where 
poets are taken so seriously that for a wrong word you can be shot. You know? <laughs> At least they are taken seriously. So I remember a similar experience. In a journal, literary theoretical journal where I was, we published a poem which, ah, the poet was some stupid drunken idiot, uh, but okay, if you read it with extreme Stalinist criminology, semiotic, you can discern some politically subversive message. You know, like there was a line in that poem, I think something like, we know who are the true fathers of our freedom. Okay, if you are fanatic, you will say, ah, do they claim that it's not the Communist Party, which, and so on, no? And the joke was this one, again, the old story. We were called to the Central Committee, it became a scandal, uh, extraordinary session of the cultural, uh, cultural, uh, uh, cultural group, whatever, of Central Committee. But speaking frankly with guys at the Central Committee, and they admitted to us here, they did privately, we told them, but are you crazy if you were to ignore this poem? Absolutely nothing would have happened. Nobody would even read this poem, that it's you with your reaction, who did the greatest, you know, the poet, who was a total coward drunkard, became a great dissident hero, <laughs> and so on. You know, it's incredible, no? So, at some point, now we come to the point, <coughs> it's not quite like that, maybe, but uh, more and more, I think, that, that was the whole point, I think we mentioned this, of political jokes. There was a myth, which unfortunately it's not true, but it's typical that there was a myth in ex-Yugoslavia and in other countries that political jokes, I mean dissident jokes against those in power, are produced by some secret, ideological secret police group, and that they are consciously, by the party spread around, to put it in simple terms, to give people an easy way out to enact their rage, you know. You are furious, things don't function, okay. You hear a good joke, you laugh, you go back to work, and so on. Unfortunately, this is not true, but it's absolutely true that political jokes did play this type of, how do they call it, constructive role. You know, that uh, they were strictly the same as what I was talking yesterday or when about the same like uh, in, uh, 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 the same like in Casablanca, all those dirty innuendos which are part of the game, uh, because you know where, which were the most interesting times of my life, my edu edu times of education. The last years of Yugoslav communism, because it still was a real totalitarian communism, but it was a soft one, no longer working seriously, which means that all these censorship mechanisms were relaxed so that their nonsense and inconsistency become, how should I put it, more and more directly palpable. For example, this idea that jokes had politicians. In those last years of Yugoslavia, where communist politicians knew there would probably be democracy and they fought for political survival, they started directly to refer themselves to the jokes about themselves to boost their popularity. It was an incredible thing, unimaginable in Stalinism. A big communist politician comes to give a speech and starts to tell jokes about himself. The great guy here was, uh, I, I will have to describe it to you because it's a complex structure but you will uh, get it a Croat politician called Jure Bilic. Jure is a Croat word for George. Jure, J-U-R-E, Bilic is just a Croat name. Okay, but remember how with each, it's like form, a predicate, you know. Bilic means just qualification of B, no? So the joke was one of these absolutely sublime East European Two le already Freud mentioned that this is the mid the, the middle European rather specialty, two level jokes. You know, you think the joke is over, but then there is another level. Okay, the point is this guy eh, visits France, Giscard d'Estaing, you remember, and learns that in France, if you 
want to appear noble, you have to add the, D-E, as you know. You are not simply Giscard Estaing, you are Giscard de, D, or Paul Dema, you know that, De of nobility. So they present each other, Giscard de Saint said, I'm Giscard de Stein. he said, Jure, of course, the joke is the B, Jure de B, the B, you know. <laughs> and then comes the wonder. Giscard says, real, de facto, and he says, no, de Jure. You know? <laughs> I mean, but isn't it wonderful? This guy told this joke about him, and it was, it was, uh, it was madness. Another element of this inconsistency, sublime. Uh, this was maybe the most perverse moment that I remember. In the last years of socialism, Slovene communists were much more business oriented than the communists in other republics. So maybe you remember it. It was, no, you're too young, most of you. In the 80s and 70s, there was a great miracle in south of Bosnia, Croat part that, uh, uh, where did it appear, uh, Virgin Mary? Medjugorje? Medjugorje, yes. It was mega. And the stupid Bosnian communists were hardliners. They didn't want to legalize it. And Slovene and Croat, other communists, were furious. Because of that, Yugoslavia lost a couple of billions of dollars. Because Italian tourist agencies entered, organized the trips and... And we, Slovene communists, who were already business-oriented, were furious. So then it happened. Close to Ljubljana, capital of Slovenia, precisely very well located, between Ljubljana and Ljubljana airport, there is some small crossing country roads where there was a statue of Virgin Mary, and that statue started to do what Virgin Mary statues are supposed to do, no? Move a little bit, cry, tears of blood, blah, blah. And the Slovene communists were delighted. Now we will teach the Bosnians how you do it. Plans were done, build hotels there, special tours. And then a catastrophe happened. The local Catholic priest in whose domain this happened made a statement where he says, no, this is not a miracle, this is just a superstition. And communists were furious, this is a unique document, in the communist official paper, they attacked this priest for non-patriotic behavior. And for him, it's economic crisis, it's his duty to help the country. No, he's doing some materialist bullshit. It was so wonderful, this, you know, or maybe you know the joke, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but it's another ultimate one. There was a student radio independent dissident in 87, 88, I'm sorry if you know the story, which was specialized in, like, provocative, out of control by the Communist Party. It's probably half liberal. Okay. They invited an old communist cadre to get, do an interview with him. This guy was old, retired, but kind of real old hard communist. And he was in a total panic, I knew him. Because he just, he knew communists will probably lose power and he terribly wanted to please the young generation, no? So he knew he must say yes, do whatever, blah, blah. So this poor old guy, I totally sympathized with him. The interviewers provoked him, like, how is your sex life? And so on. This poor guy now knew he has to say something good, positive, that's what the young generation want. But at the same time, the only language he spoke was the old communist language. So you got something so terrifying, a kind of a Stalin's style pornography, you know. This guy said, I often touch women between their legs, the feeling there helps me in my struggle for socialism. <laughs> it's kind of perversity, you know, like pornography, but as official. I mean, it was, it, I love those moments. I think these are the most productive moments where, you know, as uh, now, maybe you know this story. Uh, a friend from Egypt told me that now you have, and with my bad taste jokes, feminist, somebody told me, maybe some of you know it, I don't know if it's true or not, that in Saudi Arabia, they published two, three years ago the first, uh, this happy married life, ha sorry, happy married family life book, you know, this we have in the West, how to do sex, uh, family, 
And it's done in the very American way, with the style, you know, this easy conversation, blah, blah. But the content is the old one. So I like it, a modern book written in this way, but then it teaches the husband how to hit his wife so that it will not <laughs> hurt too much. But I like absolutely, you know, this, where these courses get mixed, for the food, you know, where, uh, okay, we are crazy. Nonetheless, so uh, what I propose then is, Nonetheless, I feel bad to give you, yeah. like you are now Comrade Stalin, um, to give the concluding world to the session of Central Committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the central um, point, and you mentioned it in the book, is around the debate between Baju and Nalaire on Sutra. Yeah. Where he goes basically to deny small object A. Yeah. Into his constitution. Although, uh, I, I mean, to give you, just bear in mind that when Miller introduced Sutra, yeah. there is also not yet uh, an object A. It's just one signifier. But, so, this is my question, actually, yeah. which is um, precisely where do we locate object A? Like, where is the excess? And it, it seems to me that, like, as you say, Baju's subject is purely situated within the imaginary chain of signifiers located in the imaginary. Uh, does that mean that he, uh, uh, what, what does he make of the phallic signifier? That's good. Yeah. But you are right, right. in no important sense that in that early stage, yeah. but you was against the notion of the subject, in that politics. Yeah, yeah. Only yeah. later, yeah. with his event, blah, blah, stuff, yeah. did he, as it yeah. were, right. Yeah. right. Yeah, but still there's the, a sort of a Deleuzian relation to the phallus as such, and, and to the negation of the phallus. What do you mean by the yeah. Yeah. Because the point that I emphasize in my book, yeah, the well, like, 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 like we can proceed yeah. without. No, but what I mean is that you know that the is people. much more ambiguous here. In his logic of sense, this is why I'm a classical Stalinist and I claim the traitor who is to be shot is Gattari, not because <laughs> because uh, in what is for me his best book, apart from difference and repetition, logic of sense. Yeah, yeah. Oedipus is not yet a bad guy there. Mm -hmm. If, if you look, ah, 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 look at around page 200 towards the end, he gives a wonderful Deleuzean rereading of Oedipus, where Oedipus is precisely, I think it's a beautiful reading, the nomadic excess which introduced flux, openness, yeah. and so on and so yeah. on. And there he even, he has maybe the best, most beautiful, here you see Deleuze's genius. Yeah. Deleuze at his best, he, a proportion point which is basically a Lacanian, yes. he does a better formulation than Lacan himself. But does the phallic signifier produce a lack? Does lack proceed in Lacan, Lacan's notion? Does lack proceed in ah, that which creates That's the a crucial question. I propose that I go into this with pleasure tomorrow. Yeah. Because here I agree with Badiou, who says that we should be very specific here which is why I think we should uh, be uh, that maybe the list is a little bit too, goes a little bit too fast when he dismisses this, you know, yeah. uh, lack, miss, blah, blah. But if you read Lacan really close, and the list is honest enough, here I must admit, even in anti Oedipus, when he goes against psychoanalysis. There are a couple of footnotes where he said, I'm talking about standard Lacanians, not about Lacan. Mm. Lacan is much more... So Lacan's appropriation. Because the yeah. first thing about Lacan is to say, you know, Deleuze, it's a wonderful quote, I quote it all the time, where he goes that what characterizes the symbolic order is there is always an empty space, space of lead, but he says, but... It's not only that there is a, an empty place in the structure, a leg, but this leg is correlated with an excess. You have a place without an object, but at the same time you have an object without place. And then, of course, the whole point of structuralism is that this common sense stupid idea doesn't work, that you say, so what's the big deal? You put the object into that place of a leg and everything. No, because they are structurally the same. This object out of place is, again, on this Mabius band, just the other side of the leg itself. It's leg itself existing as object. And I think this is crucial for Lacan. Lacan never was the way he's identified this fucking 
tragic thinker. Oh, like incest, we always miss the big object. Already, I like to emphasize this how for Lacan enjoyment. Lacan is not just saying this bullshit of we always miss the true object incest to us, it's always metonymy of a leg. Enjoyment is missing, but this, the fact that we always miss what we, you know, this is the hysterical formula, you know, the famous phrase by Lacan, uh, I, I give it to you, but it's never, it's not that, you know, like always this structure is appointment. Lacan is very clear that the other side of this is an excess, in the sense that Lacan's point is not simply we never get the full enjoyment. It's that at the same time, precisely because we don't get it, we get too much of it. This is the whole point of, for example, obsessional neurotic, or to give you the simplest example, or perverse. Let us say, uh, you know, these stupid stories, we all know them. Uh, you are an ordinary guy, like me. Okay, me, 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 I take the blame here. I would like to have girls, I'm too ugly, I don't get them, so I try to escape, to repress this, to escape into some pure space. For example, I do mathematics. But as you know then, whatever I do there, this returns. Like, I do physics and it says there how much energy is unleashed when two bodies hit each other. <laughs> Sorry, it's not right there, you know. But the thing, Lacan says, what, let's say I have a and Judith Butler at her best, her best book I think is uh, Psychic Life of Power, a modest one. She has there some good points, where he says that how the basic mechanism, Freudian, is that the repression of desire always turns around into desire for repression. Which means, and this is the whole logic of this, believe me I know it, I am the one, the, for obsessional neurotics. You fear some excess of uh, enjoyment. Let's say I have some dirty dreams, torture, sadomaso, whatever. Then, in order to keep this at a distance, I, I take refuge in obsessional rituals. You know, I will avoid this if I do these gestures. But the problem is that these very gestures get invested with the very same energy, so I start to enjoy, that, that is why even somewhere already the early Lacan gives a wonderful definition, one of possible definitions, which is also taken over, I think, by Badiou a little bit in his wonderful short text on masochism, Introduction to Zacher Masoch, where he says that the trick of, one of the tricks of masochism is this one, I have a certain illicit desire. So, since I cannot actualize it directly, I punish myself, but since in normal logic you punish yourself for illicit acts, in this way through a detour I enjoy, you know. It's a kind of a preemptive punishment. Through punishment you try to prove that you are really doing it or whatever. So, what I'm saying is that yes, here I absolutely agree that, and here also, yes, another thing. Here comes, I think, the crucial difference between desire and drive. Maybe this holds for the early Lacan of the 50s, this tragic poetry of, of desire. It's always lag, we miss it, we never get it, blah, blah, blah. But no, uh, then uh, the same, incidentally, the same logic of how jouissance is not simply impossible. It's not only something that you always miss. But it's paradoxically, at the same time, something that you never can get rid of. Like that poor guy. I want to get rid of, I do mathematics, haha, you get it there. No? And you know that for Lacan, Lacan somewhere says that it's exactly the same, exactly the same goes for free associations. Freud knows very well that there are really no free associations. Okay, there are, but you never can, you always cheat. And that's a big joke among analysts, like, I was cheating like crazy, you know, when I was with Miller, it was total fiasco. Because I, like, I invented every session that I went, I invented everything in detail, you know. All the gestures, oh, now I remembered something, fuck it, it was all planned and so on. 
But Miller got it, he was not so stupid, and he gave me the right answer. He said that, yes, there is no free association. He knows uh, uh, the patients cheat all the time, you know, like every good neurotic patient prepares in detail, usually, what he will associate. But at the same time, says Miller, the trick of a good analyst is that no matter how well you prepare it, you treat it as a free association, you know. Like, you may have invented a story, and you think you control it, but usually, what story you invent and so on, you betray yourself even more, and so on. So, you get my point. It's the same, of course, there is no pure, it's a myth that you can become some kind of a surrealist writer and really just adopt this passivity and you just freely associate. You always cheat, but this doesn't mean it doesn't work. Because even if you cheat structurally, whatever you do, it has the status of a free association and so on and so on. So even if we go back to the subject, which is why, and here I got, if I got it correctly, the trust of your question, I think that we should get rid of this notion of subjectivity, you know, this pseudo-Lacanian poetry of lack and failure and so on. This is a certain tragic logic in the line of maybe Kierkegaard, Heidegger and so on. We always fail. The only thing we can do is fail authentically and so on and so on. This is not Lacan. And, but that's why I don't like ethics of psychoanalysis. Because I think that there Lacan comes closest to this, let's call it poetry of failure, you know. But this is not uh, the last Lacan. Fuck it, the lady will kill me. Tomorrow we go on, and don't be afraid of this free talking.